I'm Robert May is joining me today. It's my good friend, Nate Tice. Nate, how you doing, buddy? Doing very well. It is October. And that this is really, especially in Vegas, because now it's the flip of when I grew up in Minnesota. It is Minnesota was freezing and like fall was like, okay, we're going to finally enjoy this kind of, you know, last a bit, bit of warmth before the winter hits. And here in Vegas, it's like, oh my God, we got through the heat. Thank God. Like, it's like, you, you're just reversing. It's a hot, cold contrast that we're going through right now, but I'm doing extremely, extremely well. I hope you're doing well as too, Robert. It's 80 degrees here, which is kind okay. of annoying. I'm, I'm trying to want to wear a sweater and it won't let me. That was always my deal in LA when my first couple of years in LA, when I moved there, I always push the sweater weather too fast because that's oh. my natural resting state. Yeah. is wearing a sweater or a light jacket like that's where i'm best Same. i don't i don't have the body type for summer never never really have but in la i always used to push it too quickly and i would be wearing a sweater when it would be like 78 degrees because it was october 20th or whatever and i was like i want this i'm demanding that this happens so i'm oh, a little annoyed about that but we're going to uh we're going to colorado this weekend and we're staying up in the mountains with our friends who are living there right now so it's going to be like 40 so i'm very ready to wear a nice Nice mid, nice midweight jacket. Midweight in, jacket, in, yeah. In, in Frisco and Breckenridge, Colorado, here over the oh, next few days. Crisp. You're just, you just want some crisp in your life. Crisp weather. The cal calendar has turned to October. We are four weeks into the season. We're about a quarter of the way in, even though the NFL decided that they were going to make this harder on us and have 17 games. So there's no clean lines anymore. I'll bring it up every year because I, I, I hate it. It like makes me antsy for a few weeks. <laughs> we are going to use this opportunity though about a month into the season to just talk about some pleasant surprises. You know, sometimes we can't really get into a couple of these teams because they still don't have the most intriguing games as part of these previews. They got one of the teams we're going to talk about today got beat up by the Niners on Sunday night. So they don't really fit neatly into some of the boxes that we've created. But I still feel like over the course of the last few weeks, there have been so many little nuggets, moments, realizations, revelations as we've gone back and watched a lot of these teams. So that's yeah. what we're going to do today. We're just going to talk about some of the most pleasant surprises, some of the most pleasant kind of unearthings that there have been over the NFL season here four weeks into the year. Yeah, it's a, oh yeah, that that one thing we offhand mentioned, we're like, oh, they're doing some, we'll, we'll talk about it later and then we just never get to it. Or like you said, there's no matchup. And also sometimes, you know, we try to predict a lot. We can't nail it. Like this is sometimes we just don't know. And sometimes that's, that's what's so amazing about the NFL. We think we know, we think we know, and we have no idea. And it is just, that that is exactly what the section is, or maybe ones that we were interested in and bumped up or ones that have been a total revelation, which I'm excited to talk about. I'm sure. And I think, you know, who I'm going to talk about, but I think you're excited to talk about that. Where do you want to start? Um, let's go, let's go with the Cardinals. I, cause I, let's just get it off. Like this is cause this has been one of my favorite watches <laughs> is the Arizona Cardinals. I Ooh. can't even believe how much I enjoy watching them, especially on offense. When I turn on the Cardinals tape, I, I just find myself in such a good place. There's right. so many different moments over the course of the game, even against the Niners where it's like, Oh, that's good. Oh, that's mm -hmm. good. Oh man. Oh, that's so close, but that's really good. And I just did not expect that to be the prevailing mood and emotion while watching the 2023 Arizona Cardinals led by Josh Dobbs, who they traded for on like August 15th. And we're shedding weight as much as they could. Like they were trying, you know, like Apollo 13. They're tearing it down. They were tearing yeah. down rebuild team. They, they, they yeah. know that they are. It was, it, but it's honestly, they, the player, some of the players that are excelling were ones that are already there, but that like you're saying, like Joshua Dobbs is, he's been tremendous. Like actually like no caveats. He's been great in the role right now. And, uh, but the stuff that they're doing there is just innovative. It's nothing. Again, this is always what some of these best offenses are. Maybe not the Dolphins or even the 49ers. It's like, it's the classics just dressed up really well. And maybe with a couple twists some good fusion restaurant going on here, but like Rondell Moore touchdown against the Cowboys that uh, I did up for wind the clock. It's just zone run zone bubble. Everybody does it, but they do it out of a funky personnel. They put Rondell Moore in the backfield. They get a funky, uh, like an interest or basic look from the Cowboys. They take advantage of it. They were taking it to the 49ers on some plays. They were really getting those guys like kind of guessing they were making them work for it. And that's all you can do. That's all you can hope for They're your first round pick. Paris Johnson looks great. This is, yeah, it's very encouraging what you're seeing. And like, shout out to Drew Petzing and shout out to Joshua Dobbs because they've they both been pulling the levers and doing a great job of operating right now. Drew Petzing, their offensive coordinator, he comes from the Browns and where Kevin Stefanski was running that sort of Kubiak-esque offense, but his background is really varied. 
You know, the only yeah. reason he brought that system with him to Arizona, quote unquote, is to use the language because it was the most recent language that he had used. Mm. But his background, there's a ton of different stuff in there. So they use a lot of different things, a lot of different components from various different offensive systems. And I, I totally agree with you. You tweeted out a plea, a play, just a mesh play on third and seven from early in the game. And it was so funny when I saw that you tweeted out because I sent it to a member of the Cardinal staff and I was like, this is really good, man. Like this is just really good stuff because the way that the routes distribute, yeah. the initial stems from the receivers are very intentional and detailed in order to kind of play with the match or the man coverage rules in that exact moment. And it just creates like a little easy completion on third yep. and seven. And uh, it was Marquis Brown walks for a first down. It's nothing yeah. crazy. It's just really good football. And that's what you see all over their offensive tape right now. You mentioned Paris Johnson. He looks excellent. And when we were talking about what what means success, what constitutes success for the Cardinals, building blocks, that was it. Mm -hmm. Can you find your building blocks moving forward? And from day one that he looks as good as he did, he does as a top 10 pick, the first pick of this regime. That's excellent. Yelta Froholt, their center. We've mentioned him a bunch of different times. He comes over from the Browns career yep. backup. He's doing such good stuff for them. DJ Humphreys has had some really nice moments. Yep. Uh, what the, what's happening with Michael Wilson, who I thought was an interesting prospect. He had yep. a really good senior bowl week. Just some of like the clips from practice. I was like, oh man, he seems like a pretty detailed route runner. He seems like a very reasonable starter for their offense yeah. here moving forward. So everything about what's happening. And this isn't like a weird curiosity. They are seventh in offensive DVOA through four weeks. Like they it's are playing real. pretty good football against some of the best defenses in the league. That's the thing. It's the Cowboys. It's Washington. It's the 49ers like they. this is like they've they've had to work for it. It's been great. Uh, the mesh play that you talked about was great because on it, they just create three levels on it. And again, it's nothing revolutionary. It's not they, it's not like they created a route or anything like that. But I love that you pointed out the details of it. And that's what's been so cool. It's these staples dressed up very well. Um, I wrote about uh, the Cowboys this week, but it was great watching the Cardinals go against this 49ers defense. We'll talk about that game in a sec. Don't you guys worry. But it's but that matchup, it was great watching Cardinals go against the 49ers defense. If I were a coach, I would love that film. They did a little bit of everything. It was well executed. They played with different personnel. They used different formations. So it's like, wow, okay, this is effective. Okay. And they're maximizing it. Like all the stuff is, it's sound. And I'm just like... It, did not expect this at all. So it's just been very cool to see guys like Hollywood Brown getting like nice, efficient catches, getting used to his skill set. And it's great. It, it's really good stuff. It's inventive stuff in the run game. It's nice, classy passing game stuff that's dressed up. I, I really like it. And even, they were even a few inches away from like three or four more big gains against the Niners. Like things were blocked up well. If you're not playing against Fred Warner on like a half dozen plays in that game, you're getting chunks in those moments. Yeah. And that's the nature of being at a talent deficit. But the fact that a lot of the stuff on the chalkboard looks really, really good on this design, we have a half or hat, everybody, like everyone's yeah. blocked up. And they had that so many times in that game. It's just like, oh, our guys just aren't quite there. And yeah. that is a really encouraging sign. The fact that everyone's pointed in the right direction, you're just, the gap is a little bit too it's big. That's a good place for this Cardinals team to be. The run plays are blocked for the running back to get to the safety. And then the running back's job is to make the safety miss. There was a lot of safety tackles in that game. So if, if, does that make sense? So there's a lot of runs that got to the safety. I shouldn't say a lot, but a handful that got to the safety, which is, means that that was blocked to the hilt. That means that was blocked perfectly. But then it got the running back got tackled. So it was an eight-yard gain. It's a 10-yard gain as opposed to a, a touchdown. Like, But you look at the other side of the ball, and then that game we'll talk about looking what a guy like CMC does <laughs> as opposed yeah. to maybe a backup running back for the Cardinals or even James Conner, who's been playing very well and very efficient. He's great right now, but it's, you know, he's not CMC. Let's talk about another team that's in this very same vein. And that is what the Houston Texans have looked like over the first four weeks of the year. The Texans are fifth in passing DPOA. It's four weeks. Uh, all yeah. the necessary all caveats this. about small sample size, everything. Yes. But they have been one of the most efficient passing offenses in football over the first month of the year without four fifths of their starting offensive line from before. The that's season. that's like that's the shocking part. If they had like a fully healthy, it'd be like, OK, all right. They got some stuff but like offensive linemen wiped out with a rookie quarterback. And this is what they're doing. Yeah, it's first it's, time it's offensive stunning. play caller. Never seen him before. Yeah. Again, one of those franchises that it felt like they were just so rudderless for the right. last few years. And to immediately just see a team, an offense especially, but the defense too, to a certain extent, 
be injected with energy, have direction, have just life. That that is what the Texans feel like right now. And it's easy to feel that way when you have a top five quarterback that's playing the way that CJ Stroud is. But so many aspects of the way the offense is designed, Mm -hmm. the positions they're putting guys in. Bobby Sloak, their offensive coordinator, took a lot of the core philosophies and models about why the Niners brand of football makes things easy on players and brought it over to Houston. If you look at the amount of cover three they've seen on early downs, it's similar to the Niners. The personnel packages that they're playing with, the ways that they're using their fullback to kind of help them in pass protection. It's just little tiny edges that they're creating consistently for themselves combined with real flashes from a core of young players that's very easy to get excited about. Yeah, everyone's playing hard there too. Like I uh, mentioned on Sunday, but the run, the receivers have been a, receiver blocking, which is always a highlight for me, has been great because it's like everybody there. It's the Robert Woods class. Like, Noah Brown's hurt. He, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of the guys we thought would do the dirty work, but like Noah Collins has been great as a receiver. He's great as a blocker. John Mechie is becoming like he is a great dirty work guy right now. And he's like per- he's finding this perfect role in this offense. But the trigger man, the designs have been sound. And the trigger man has been just, he has gone to the right place almost every time, which is a guy for that's only been starting in the NFL for less than a month. It's as encouraging, encouraging as you can get. Like Stroud's accuracy, his timing, his ability to kind of just always know to get rid of the ball at the right time, even from off platform stuff, has already been like really cool to watch. Something like, you know, he hasn't had maybe a ton of those like super, super highlight throws where it's just like, oh my no. God, it's the, the Staffords or the Herberts. But it's just this sheer efficiency, and he has more juice in his arm than even maybe I gave him credit for. But th- that accuracy, that quick throwing motion, getting pointed in the right direction, the eyes going to the perfect spot. It's like, wow, this is this is really encouraging stuff from a guy that only has a couple starts. Something you pointed out this week, I, and I, I talked to Chase about this when we talked about Stroud a couple weeks ago, I, that I thought was just really notable is his ability to get different throws off from different arm angles, but also... Yeah how quickly he does it like on screens right how many screens have been blown up in the nfl this year because a quarterback doesn't put the right loft on it or can't get the ball off sidearm or whatever his ability to just get the ball out of his hands at different angles this year has been really notable like it's a small thing but it's just a part of his game that has given them an edge and just like the cardinals i'm having so much fun watching them play football i they were left for dead like I, I, there was nothing about the Texans that would have made me pay attention to them over the last couple of years because they didn't give me reason to No, when you made the moves that they made, we're rolling with Davis Mills again. We're hiring Lovey Smith as our head coach. You're telling me how to feel. And now you go get to Miko Ryans. You go make the play for the quarterback and you look like this. You're telling me to pay attention to you and I'm enjoying it while I do. It's great. The the defense plays hard. I mean, Will Anderson looks great. Like so, again, building blocks. And and when your best players are the ones playing the hardest, that's the best. And like you don't have to teach much. And it just, I mean, or you do have to teach well. And I think that's actually what D'Amico Ryan's Bobby Slug are doing right now. Like both sides of the ball are well coached. They're doing really good stuff. But the thing is, that I just want to say too is with Stroud, is just I'm glad you brought up that point with the creative throwing, like. He's way more of a creative thrower than I thought he could be. I thought he'd be trying to be too perfect all the time, which I liked, but it's, you know, I, there's golf comparisons to that, that regard, but it's like, oh my God, he's, he has way more trick shots to him. Way than I ever. More. Oh my way God. He's more. great on RPOs. He is so, like tight, tight pockets. He's helped that offensive line. The offensive line has played way above their weight, no pun intended, but they honestly, him like just maneuvering in there, just getting balls off and giving plays chances. The AFC South is going to have him, Anthony Richardson, and Trevor Lawrence, who all avoid sacks at a high level already. And like the AFC South, like teams, like sacks are going to be like deflated. Like <laughs> I think for the, like the next ten years. But if this is how these guys are going to operate, again, it's only a month, but still, it's like such promising stuff. The early returns are so promising. Yeah, and the fact that this draft class looks as good as it does already. Stroud, Will Anderson's consistently disruptive, even though his sack totals haven't been there yet. They no. will come. He is already a disruptive player a month into the season. It's he That's is right. a joy to watch. And even the guys further down the draft class, Henry Toto, to, 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 Henry Toto, I'm turning into you. Henry Toto, <laughs> going back and watching that Steelers game, he's a linebacker they drafted, I believe, in the fifth round. And he has he looked excellent. He didn't look yeah. out of place for a second. He's making plays against the run. He gloved up a route in the red zone by George Pickens that was absolutely gorgeous. And I'm watching him play, watching Will Anderson, the way Tank Dell has done. It's like, this could be like a transformative right. draft class for, yeah. for this franchise that badly needed one. So it's just a great, great start. 
they went from a rookie starting center to a backup rookie starting center and I haven't missed a beat on offense. It's like, that's good. <laughs> that, that is a, you can't be mad at this, this first month of the D'Amico Ryan's era in, in Houston. So the next thing I wanted to acknowledge is some of the, the smart moves that GMs made to protect themselves this off season. And the, uh, why I wanted to mention this is because when I was watching the Texans, watching what George Fant was doing at right tackle, a guy that got off the street after Titus Howard got hurt, Nick Casario being as proactive as he was to do that. It, it's changed their season. Mm -hmm. The fact that they've had a functional guy to play right tackle for them as they've dealt with all these injuries. He's been more than okay. And Titus Howard is about to come back. Same thing on defense. They lose Derek Stingley. Yep. They have Shaq Griffin, who they signed for nothing this offseason because he was expensive in Jacksonville. He made multiple plays against the Steelers. And just protecting yourself in those areas is so important as you build the roster. Same thing about the Lions and their secondary. They right. lost CJ Gardner Johnson, Kirby Joseph, Emmanuel Mosley was hurt last week. They didn't even, you didn't even notice nope. because they still have Tracy Walker. Jerry Jacobs is somebody that can make you know the requisite amount of plays. What Brian Branch has given them, uh, Isaiah Wynn, the Isaiah Wynn signing and what it's done for the Dolphins offensive line. You know, he's not an all pro player, but it's such a small upgrade that has really changed the way that they can play when they're healthy. Leonard Floyd, Taylor Rapp, these guys that just you understand the thought, you understand why teams are trying to build these units this way. And already through the first month, it's like, oh, man, like that, just being proactive and thinking about those like collective units, defensive lines, secondary offensive lines that with that level of intentionality, it's already paid dividends for these teams. Competency, like just having competent play is so huge and just not having like we'll talk about the team later, but just having it like just a turnstile at some of those spots or just something that can be targeted over and over by quarterbacks, by opposing teams, quarterbacks. No, that is so huge. And that's honestly leads into like my next one, which kind of ties into this is that like some teams that were beat up last year on defense, just you can gash them in the, in the run game have said no more. They said, no, we are not doing this again. The lions, the Falcons, even the Jags and Seahawks, all these teams that used to be able to just run the ball on them last year, especially last year, what are now all in the top 10. I believe the lions are fourth in rushing success rate last year. They were 29th and they have most of the same guys. So it's just all these guys stepping up and getting better and better coach and a good system around them. The Falcons were 29th overall last year, 31st in stopping the run, our fifth in uh, overall success rate, eighth in stopping the run. Like, and this is without any, like they have turnovers, don't get me wrong, but like not like just an overwhelming amount, not an overwhelming amount of sacks. This is just down to down, better play. The Jags are in the top 10 of both. They were bottom 10 in both last year. The Seahawks are second last year. They're middle of the pack. And that was a huge weakness against them. Watch what the Raiders did to them. Like they, they just have their day with them. So I, all these teams that through personnel, like you mentioned, like, especially with like the Lions, and really just maybe better coaching at all these spots. And just, yeah, it, it's really cool to see teams rather than just wave it away and, you know, just, ah, uh, here's one guy, uh, here's two. Like, really just like, no, we need a lot. We need to really reload, re, you know, recalibrate our entire attack or just get new coaches, like in the Falcons case, um, and a lot of new personnel guys. Like, but all the, find these different ways. The Seahawks kind of, you know, got better players, but they also kind of tweaked some things up front. And all these things are really helping these teams out. So, even when the offenses dip, like the Falcons or the Jags, like these teams have been in games because their defenses have stepped up. The Lions defense in general is on my list. Just watching that Lions defense, the attitude that they're playing with, the development that you've gotten from so many of the young guys, like what Aiden Hutchinson looks like this year, what Ali McNeil looks like this year. I know Brian Branch is a rookie, but just that young core of defensive players and the way they're playing on that side of the ball. And then this is a Lions adjacent one. I, it's not necessarily like a pleasant surprise because he played pretty well last year. I once again want to comment on how much I'm enjoying Jared Goff play quarterback this season. Like he is absolutely <laughs> so ripping it back there. Yeah. I it's it's a it's a blast. It like, this is a guy who left on the street essentially was thrown into that deal. People were construing the returns for the Stafford trade and saying that the reason it was so high is because the lions took on Jared Goff's contract and he's not paid peanuts. $30 million a year for quarterback is decent money, but he is enjoyable to watch. We yeah. can have conversations about what the future looks like when we get there and we can cross that bridge when we get there. But in this moment, the lions are a top five to seven offense in every conceivable category and this is a guy who is trying to 
rip as many cool throws as he can whenever they are available to him. And I personally am thoroughly enjoying it. He's got way more gunslinger than I think people realize. And it's awesome. Like it's that, that offense asks him to make some real big throws and he's willing to do it. It's the best. I, I you gotta love that. I mean, between like him and like Gino in Seattle, like those guys will stand in there. It's a great comparison. Know, and just rip it and like big, like 15, 20 yard throws. So no, th- I totally agree. I, I've never been as much of a golf hater as I see sometimes on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't been like a golf lover, but I like, I appreciate his game. He's tough as hell. That's the other thing with golf is like, even when he was with the ramps, he'd be getting my clothesline. Sometimes he just step right back up. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, also want to would have done like speaking of Rams Rams offense, but I, we were going to talk about them later. So mm-hmm. I, but I do want to give them a big shout out. Um, I also want to maybe give some players some shout outs. Is that okay right now? Let list them off. Go. Okay. So first off a player that not, no caveats. This is not like some hipster role player kind of thing. Just like straight up has become a top 10, 12 player for me to watch is Brandon. Ayuk. I am. I, I'm so glad you're here. I've seen the light, but he is, he's leveled up leveled up like several levels and he is he's fantastic he's doing the dirty work i know he got highlighted against the steelers but he's doing all the dirty work stuff he's doing i mean uh, the unbelievable plays with the balls and ball in his hands his route running has got even better and crisper and he's just so explosive i I just i he's amazing and so yeah he is a superstar superstar he is an unbelievable player i'm so glad i finally got here because i've loved we know that i've talked about this i've loved him for years and th- this him in his full form this year, getting to watch him do everything. Oh my God. He is a force yep. of nature. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's like, and he was in the doghouse last year with Shanahan and it's like, he came out and ever since then he's been just fantastic, man. Uh, so yeah, I, he's not usually the type of receivers kind of those wild route running receivers, just more explosive and more just traits than anything they've honed it in. And I mean, it's just a fantastic. So yeah, Brandon, Ayuk. Um, another one, Luke Decky. I didn't think would have a chance really to stick in the league. And he's been great at right tackle. I don't say great, but good at right tackle for the box. He plays with the box. He has been yes. so much better than he was last year. So really. much better. So much better. Samson Ebicamp has been a terror for the Colts. Uh, I mean, he has been such a great pass rusher. He got that level up from the 49ers and he's been a lot of fun to watch. So a guy that I thought was more fine has been legit good or even very good. Um, so I just wanted to give him a shout out as well. Uh, and Byron Young as well. It's like, he, he's really Byron. good for the Rams. Edge for the Rams. They're yeah. Really good playing, for the Rams. Didn't think I thought he'd be like a designated pass rusher. He's playing like a bunch of snaps for him. He's a dark horse for defensive rookie of the year. Uh, but yeah, Byron Young too with the Rams. We've already talked so much about the Browns defense. One guy on the Browns defense I wanted to mention just because I think he represents something. I, I mentioned him a bunch of times. Grant Delpit and his oh, development yeah. for the Browns. It is so cool to watch young players get better. And he is a guy that really encapsulates that to me this year. And the other guy I'd mentioned, same position, just the development from last year to this year and what he looks like is Andre Cisco from the Jags where you have these younger safeties that like they finally they really great. get to, they understand the game and they understand their role and they understand where they're supposed to be everything about it they just settle in and watching those two guys do that has been awesome uh one more that I wanted to mention before we move on I'm so impressed with the Seahawks coaching staff on offense oh yeah the they've got went out their two starting tackles since the midway through week one They've done such a great job of building a useful offense out of the group that they've had. They lead the league in dropbacks with six or seven guys in protection. Like they've just done such a good, thoughtful job of giving their quarterback time to throw with a tattered offensive line. And I just love watching that. Andy Dickerson, their offensive line coach, Shane Waldron, their offense coordinator, who we've talked about. I just definitely wanted to mention them because I just think that they deserve so much credit for what that offense has looked like despite some of the injuries that they've had to deal with. Great call. I mean, the, the defensive staff, staff, so just like the Seahawks coaches in general, <laughs> it's yeah, defensive staff has done a great job and uh, like figuring out, fixing some things. But yeah, no, the Shane Waldron and uh, with the Seahawks and Ben Johnson with the Lions, like those guys to me are like front runners for head coach for next year because of what they've done, what they've adjusted, how they teach guys because their stuff is so clean. So I, I've liked, I've really liked that. We, if you're an offensive guy, if you like to hire the offensive coordinator for your head coaching, for your head coaching spot, I like those two as like my front runners right now. Last one. This is not a surprise because they were so good last year. It is so cool that a guy that looks like, sounds like, acts like Mike McDaniel is changing the way that offensive football is played in the NFL. It took a week for half the league 
let, let's say a quarter of the league, the smart teams to just straight up steal the motion that they used in week one. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. I went back and watched the entire Bears Broncos game. They're just lifting everything from what the Dolphins did the week before. It's yeah. the same motion, some of the ways they're using 21 personnel, some of the split stone stuff that they were doing. The Dolphins' influence on the NFL is so pronounced. And the fact that that guy is at the center of it is just great. So I just wanted to mention that before we moved on because I just get so much pleasure out of it. It's, you know, it's the Quentin Tarantino. They're not copying it, it's an homage. You know, that's <laughs> that's what they're doing, doing to that stuff. No, but it's a copycat league and it happens quicker and quicker and quicker every single year. Well, uh, we have a primetime marquee matchup between two of the classic franchises in the NFL. And we spent 20 <laughs> minutes talking about the Cardinals and the Texans. So let's talk about the game of the week. That is the they Dallas that, Cowboys facing off against the San Francisco 49ers. They call that burying the lead. <laughs> that was... Oh, we're excited, guys. There's a lot of cool stuff in the league right now, but this game is going to be freaking awesome. I don't, I'm sorry, but I know we're jumping into it, but I, I, like, you know the fight scene in They Live between Rowdy, Rowdy, Rowdy Piper and Keith David? It lasts, I've like, never seen They Live. Okay, you should. It's Yeah. I, I love know. my Carpenter movies. So I know. I know. Okay. Check it out sometime, but it's a famous fight scene, and it lasts like eight minutes like six minutes, seven minutes. It's, it's hilarious. It's, it just keeps going and going and going. It's like sideshow Bob stepping on the rake. But uh, yeah, that's why I think this game's going to be just a fist fight for 60 minutes instead of six minutes. Uh, but I cannot wait for this matchup. I'm going to watch. They live next week. It's, it's spooky sure. season. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I, I, you know, I me. I'm not a huge, I'm not a horror. huge horror guy, but it, I know it's not, it's not like a horror. It's horror not horror. Yeah, it's yeah. more like a satire, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. why I, I'm into it. All right. I'm going to watch it this week. You've convinced okay. me. Okay. Sweet. This is a matchup of arguably the two best teams in the NFL so far. Easily, I think the two best teams in the NFC pretty comfortably. The Eagles are obviously undefeated. The Eagles are going to yeah. be there till the end. But these two teams on both sides of the ball have played extremely well over the first couple of weeks. It's a matchup that we've seen. And Here's where I want to start this, okay? It's easy to kind of feel the heat coming off of this, but then I think back to the divisional round, and I think about the performance that the Cowboys' offense had against this Niners' defense. And to me, it takes a little bit of the steam off of it because of how just thoroughly dismantled they were on that side of the ball. So I wanted to ask you, why is this going to be different? Like, what is different about this version of the Cowboys' offense under Mike McCarthy than the one we saw at the end of the season just get beat up by the Niners. I would say first off, beat up is a good way to put it. Uh offensive line, I think it just got announced today. We'll have the five starting offensive line for the Cowboys healthy for the first time right. over a year. And the other thing is, yeah, they've upgraded their personnel. They have, you know, they have Brandon Cooks. Michael Gallup looks, you know, looks a hundred percent or as a hundred percent as he probably could be. You know, Tony Pollard's not on the field a lot. That's obviously more juice. I think Jake Ferguson's an upgrade over Dalton Schultz already, uh, as as far as a pass catcher, because he is just more explosive. And of course, in CD Lamb and, and you know, has is just fantastic. <laughs> like they, he's he's been fantastic on the outside. They sprinkle him in a little bit on the outside. But I think this team, and maybe why this matchup might go different is it's a strength on strength, but it's something that the Cowboys can get away with. And I think that they have some ways to bait this 49. I would say bait this 49ers defense, but the 49ers defense is bend, but don't break, but just supercharged. And just like a, as high as that can be, they've given up the least amount of explosive plays through four weeks since 2020, 2002 when the NFL went to 32 teams, the Cowboys have been using quick game and running the ball at one of they the highest on explosive plays. They do not live on explosive plays. They are, they, the 49ers go, you have to eat your vegetables. And the Cowboys are like, okay, <laughs> they are okay with it. And they're playing with a quarterback that is totally fine with it. Dak Prescott right now is a quick game under center, quick game machine right now. He has a second low shotgun rate. He's thrown a top five quickest rate right now among all QBs. And the fastest is his entire career is his average time to throw. He's throwing under six air yards per attempt. Drew Brees in his last year at 40 years old was 6.1. Dak yeah, Prescott it's, it's dead last in the NFL. It's 5.6. Yeah. It's dead last in football right now. Drew Brees was 6.1. We used to like laugh at that. Like in his last year at 40 years old, he's half a yard uh, uh, shorter, but it's working. But this is the difference between what we'll talk about with bad offenses and this offense when they have low air yards is that that's usually like, oh, check down, check down, screen, screen, screen. This offense is they're getting these four, five, six-yard gains over and over. 
They have the most time, uh, most plays per drive, longest time of possession per drive. It's a ball control on high on base percentage offense. That this is how they're thriving. And I think it's going to be super interesting going against a defense that actually wants you to do that, and they punish you, and, or they, they they make you make uh, short gains over and over. So it's it's a great styles make fights. It's funny I had the, the same stat: the first first in plays per drive, their fifth in points per drive, despite being an obnoxiously bad red zone offense like obnoxiously bad they've been awful which we can talk about if you want to but uh, they've they're still scoring because of how efficient that they've been yeah they are they have the fourth lowest three and out percentage in the league bring it back a little bit the cardinals and the texans are second and third like, that's how good hey. the cardinals and texans have been in avoiding those moments and what's so funny is that i totally i'm with you that when you have these offenses that are so low in air yards to throw, typically we look at that and just immediately get grossed out. And that's yeah. justifiable because the five other teams at the bottom of that list, if you look at it, are in the bottom five in EPA per dropback. They're bad passing offenses. Yep. The Cowboys are fifth in EPA per dropback despite having the lowest air yards per attempt in the entire NFL. And what they've done is they've created this offense where they can just kind of chew up a relative amount of yards on first and second down, give themselves manageable third downs, and then they're converting on third down. So the Cowboys right now are 30th in the average yards they face on third down, average yards to go. They are first in the NFL in third down conversion rate, 51.6%. The league average is about 40%. If you give him deck third and four, he's going to get it. Like he, it's, he's... A, it's a tough way to live, yeah. but they have they've made it work for them because their quarterback is so capable in those situations. And yep. the Niners... Like you said, they're built to take away explosive plays. Where the Niners really show up, there's a a beautiful example from the Cardinals game. The Cardinals are trying to run a deep over-off play action, and they're in a three-by-one, and it's cover three, and uh, Fred Warner has to carry number two all the way across the field, and he does it easily. Like He's just carrying a slot receiver 25 yards down Mm -hmm. the field in a way that no other off-ball linebacker in the league can do. The Cowboys aren't trying to do that. They're just trying to dink and dunk. So all this athleticism you have, all this range that you have as a defense almost gets negated because of the way the Cowboys want to play. Again, it's a thin margin. It's not easy to live that way, but it makes for a really fascinating matchup between these two teams. It's small ball. Like that's, that's what they're playing. It's singles and bunting and stealing bases. Like that's what this team is. It's, but, but in a good way, like not in a like desperation way. It's, it's, it is interesting. I, it's usually something I hate. Like I hate quick, I hate quick game, heavy offenses. Anyone that's heard me on this show. I just, I, it's not something I believe in this offense though. They have the second highest design run rate right now on sec on first and second down only behind the 49ers. So maybe look for a very quick game here, but, and, and, uh, but so they have a high design run rate. They throw a bunch of quick game, which is old school West coast way of replacing the run. So Mike they McCarthy, run high. Maybe. And then they run quick game at a high level. And then they just, you know, in, in my article this week, I wrote about this matchup and I compared it that you have the 49ers defense that is Floyd Mayweather on defense when he's boxing. It's the Philly shell. But then the Cowboys offense is Floyd May- Mayweather on the other side, jabbing and th- <laughs> and beating up on the gash and winning on points. Like that's exactly what this matchup is. So it's, yeah, it's death by five yard gains versus a defense that wants you to get three yards. So it's that battle of two yards for every single play couple more things to mention about this matchup specifically. We have the two guards for Dallas with Zach Martin and the way that Tyler Smith is playing, playing against the tackles for the Niners. One of the coolest matchups of the year so far. Yep. Tyler Smith is playing at an absurd level. He was a really <laughs> impressive run blocker last year. So powerful. You could see the traits. How comfortable and assured he looks as a pass blocker this year Amazing. is seriously impressive. So him going against Javon Hargrave, anytime that happens on Sunday, very excited about that. And then the other, just one quick thing, the stats on Dallas in the red zone, just worth mentioning. They're 30th in red zone efficiency this year. They are 31st in goal to go efficiency this year. They have, they've scored a touchdown on 41.7% of their goal to go opportunities. The league average is 75%. I was going to say, yeah, it's it got to be over 70. Yeah. You can construe this one of two ways. One, that is a, rotten part of Dallas's offense that needs to be fixed, which there's probably some truth to that. The Mm -hmm. other side of that is they're bound to get better. And the fact that they've already been so successful this year, and again, they're near the top of the league in points per drive, despite stalling out in the red zone as often as they have, 
that is probably an indication that things are going to be even better moving forward. And and also, I just you know that the just, red the third the third down numbers also may regress. So there, right. there's thing, competing elements the, here for the, the first and second down, first and second down has been pretty good, and defense is getting a lot of turnovers. Uh, but that's the thing is this often this is complementary football. They they have a, a an incredible defense that gets a lot of big plays and gets the ball back, gets turnovers, and they have an offense that's just going to grind it out. So it's okay if a, if an offense has a three and out against this team or has a quick turnover like the Patriots or the Jets did, and then this team, even though it's like a 40-yard field, it's a seven-play, three-minute, 50-second, you know, 40-play, a 40-yard drive for a touchdown. It's like, okay, we just turned the ball over, and we haven't seen the ball now for forever. That's It's complimentary football. Their run game, they do – I know this is a whole discussion right now, but run game and the play action off of it, they get that's where they get the big plays, but it works for how they play because they run the ball a ton. So it's just it all works in a weird way. I don't should say a weird way, a traditional way that you sometimes don't really see like it to this extent. It's very just traditional. Yeah, I think that's the the traditional football that these Cowboys are playing. So getting to the other side of the ball, I found this stat really interesting. So the Cowboys this season, again, based on the small ball way they play, they have faced 62 third downs which is the second highest number in the entire NFL. The Niners have faced 43 third downs, which is 30th. And part of the reason that the Niners have faced only 43 third downs is they don't need to get to third down. Mm -hmm. They have been so brutally efficient on first and second down. They rank second on first and second down at creating first downs. That's how good that they've been. It's absolutely crazy how dominant, explosive, and efficient their offense has been on early downs. And so now you have this Niners offense playing as well as it has ever played mm -hmm. uh, under Kyle Shanahan. It, they have completely tapped in to what their personnel is and how to deploy it. And now you're playing against one of the best defenses in the league. It does not get much better than this. With repeat play callers on both sides, which is always the best. Because now we're, I mean, two huge playoff games the last two years. And then now this game on Sunday night too. Which is, oh, this could be awesome. But honestly, it, it's this run game of course, from Shanahan, but like they're varying it up, which they've done the last few years. And that's not just all zone. It's a little bit of everything, which I think is great getting a lot of pullers involved against a very aggressive Cowboys defense. There might be some defensive plays by the Cowboys, you know, where Parsons or Demarcus Lawrence or one of the defensive tackles shoots the gap and gets someone on a puller. But I think it's going to be to their advantage because, you know, <laughs> these wild, this crazy defense running every which way is going to be trying to track pullers and different guys and different guys in motion. But this offense in different ways, no matter what the concept is, they are attacking at two and 10 o'clock uh, of the defense and then hitting that at midnight. So it's just, it's the classic stretch, stretch outside zone and then hit North. But now they're doing it with counter power. They're a pin pull. They're doing all these different ways. They're doing it, tossing it ball out to CMC on a swing pass. And that's just more of an outside version. He stretches it and gets North. It's like, that's what they just keep doing over and over. CMC is, you know, they have a lot of stars uh, of this band on offense. CMC is the lead singer. Like everything that just lives through him on the ground and in the pass game. And then they just got the explosive element with Brandon Ayuk, who is just playing phenomenally right now. It's just, it, this offense is kicking so much ass right now. <laughs> One thing I thought was notable when I was looking at some of the numbers around the Niners is just some of the changes that have happened on early downs this year. So, they faced cover three at the highest rate in the NFL on early downs last year, which makes total sense. They mm -hmm. live in 21 personnel and you have to acknowledge the threat of the run. So you just have a lot of heavy boxes and a lot of cover three on early downs. Well, teams realize what they were doing, just gashing them through the air when they lined up that way. So like, we're not going to do this anymore. So it's gone from 52% cover three on first and second down to 42%. The quarters number has gone way up. So it's gone from 6% to 18%, the amount of quarters that they see on early downs. So the boxes have gotten lighter. Last year, they faced an eight-man box on 54% of their early down rushes, which is the highest rate in the league. This year, it's 42%. But the yes. problem is they're playing with heavier personnel. Mm -hmm. They're using more 22 personnel with two tight ends and two backs and more 21 personnel. So they're getting lighter boxes, but they're playing heavier. And the response has been they're just gashing people in the run game. They're sure. saying, all right, fine. If you want to play like this, we're just going to run the ball down your throat consistently. Yeah. And the moment you give us the advantageous looks to throw it, that's what we're going to do. So no matter what teams are doing against them, they have a really solid answer. What makes this matchup fascinating is that 
the Cowboys don't play base defense. So you have these light bodies on the field for the Cowboys. And theoretically, it would allow the Niners to run the ball, but the Cowboys can defend the run even with those light bodies on the field. Last year in the divisional round, the Niners ran the ball 30 times on early downs. They had a 42% rushing success rate. They averaged 3.5 yards per carry. So that model, even against this Cowboys team, that theoretically, if you look at the matchup on paper, we should be able to run the ball on them. It's not that easy. So yeah. I'm curious what this looks like. And the two things I come back to where the matchups could exist, the Niners are doing an unbelievable job of creating matchups for McCaffrey against linebackers oh. because they're putting teams in base. They find the one-on-one -on -one consistently with alignment and it's just over. And against the Cowboys, if you're going to attack them in one area, it's their linebackers and coverage and just their linebackers yeah. in general. We saw what the Cardinals did to them. And the other thing is Bland has played a lot better in the first last couple of games on the outside than he did against Arizona in just a few select moments. But Ayuk against him, that is going to be a very real test in some of those one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside. So those are kind of the two individual things that I'd be looking for. Yeah, uh, I think that makes total sense because this offense right now in the passing game is they're getting their chunk plays with choice routes to Christian McCaffrey and they're giving it off play action and why they're hitting those play actions is because that quarter stuff that you just talked about now they're getting to take advantage of those safeties driving on stuff and coming down to fill up the run and they're just launching it <laughs> I, they had at least four of them against the Cardinals that were just huge gash plays I mean it was just all over the place and and that's the things that you can take advantage of that a defense wants to play that way. So I always, it's who covers. And if you want to play man coverage, like the Cowboys like to do, who covers McCaffrey? Okay. If he covers certain so-and-so covers McCaffrey. Okay. Then who covers Debo? Who covers IU? Who covers all these guys? Because that's where they can create matchups too, just by formation. And I just want one last IU stat. I probably should have brought this up when I was talking about him as a freaking baller is that he has, what is it? Oh, he's been targeted 20 times. 17 of those targets have gone for first downs. Insane player. 17 first downs on 20 targets. It's, it's insane. He has a higher explosive pass rate. He's first in everything. Successful targets per route, explosive receptions per route. He's hiring Tyreek Hill, who has like, he's shattering his numbers right now. I know he only has like 70 routes run right now, but still it's like, he's exceptional, exceptional player. So good luck guarding that one-on-one -on -one for 60 minutes. What's kind of funny looking back at the division round matchups from last year, the Cowboys played quarters on 30% of their early down snaps, essentially. Okay. Their average for the regular season was 5%, which was 29th say. in the NFL. So the Cowboys game plan from last year, where they played a lot more quarters on early downs, yeah. is now the game plan that defenses Meta. as a whole are trying to adopt against the Niners on early downs. Best. Love this. So, very, very cool stuff, and just a matchup that is going to be a blast to watch. Typically, with the way our Sunday night show is scheduled and the way it's structured, we don't always dig really deep into the Sunday night game. We will be talking about the Sunday night game on our Sunday night show, so what. please come by and hear about some Cowboys Niners talk when we get there. It's going to be great. Oh, Kaiju battle. Let's get to the matchup of the week. It was funny during our production meeting this week when we picked the stuff we're going to talk about. We're getting our, like, what's, what's the matchup of the week going to be? And I kind of sheepishly was like rams eagles rams offense eagles defense and you and bell are in unison we're just like yes that's the one yes. that i had too that and was it. it's just one of those things if i had told you on august 15th that our week four matchup was going to be the rams offense against the eagles defense because of all the cool stuff going on on both sides of the ball there i would not have believed you i don't think even if i was At all. relatively bullish on the rams offense compared to other people yeah, I, I didn't think they'd be bad, but they've been legit good, <laughs> and it's awesome. Obviously, Puka and Nakua is getting a lot of highlights, but everything we've talked about like on the show after some of these games, I mean, it just the Sunday Rams-Colts game was just a highlight factory. It was just the best. Between Anthony Richardson and Stafford, it was just like one of the best like blow for blow kind of just quarterback be quarterback, just throwing haymaker, throwing haymaker back and forth. It was awesome. But this Rams team, it's their – what I think has been really interesting, and this is what Shanahan guys – okay, when you hear a lot of guys compliment like some of these quarterbacks that maybe some people on Twitter like don't like, they're like, oh, they're boosted by the Shanahan system. Is And, and then you hear people that kind of defend it go like, oh, well, they can you know be in the offense. They can operate the offense. They can do the terminology. It's because they package so much stuff together. There's mm -hmm. so much verbiage that these guys have to execute. That's why they value that so much high, so highly. And when you watch this Rams offense, why I want to bring that up is 
usually when we see package plays for canned plays, killed plays, alerted plays, whatever terminal terminology you want to use going from one play to the other, it's from the same formation. Okay. So, all right, that's fine. Okay. We, we start from the same formation. Now these kind of Shanahan tree guys have upgraded that and others have copied it as well. We're going to motion or we're going to shift and then we'll kill the play. Watching this Rams team right now, they will almost like a Madden player audibling from one formation and one play to the other one. That's what they're doing. They'll start under center, condense formation. All right, hide, hide. Okay, look, look. Okay, you're in single high. Boom. Okay, now we go into a shotgun and it's total, everybody's lined up totally differently. And it's just the verbiage on that must be ridiculous. That's like a 20 something <laughs> play word play call. And that's what I just thought that was a long winded way to say. This team's doing some cool stuff because they're getting some ideal looks in the run game and the pass game. And they're just blocking up really well, doing some really nice things in the run game, creative, uh, like creative wise. And Stafford's just ripping it all over the yard. And they might get Cooper Cup back this week, which is freaking awesome. Most interesting thing to you specifically about how this version of the Rams matches up with what we've seen from the Eagles so far. Um how did they get to their runs like and also how did they it, okay so pass the eagles run defense is very good out of base out of heavier bodies mm -hmm. the rams have sprinkled in some 12 and some tight ends to uh get to some play action stuff which has been very good for them but you can't really run out of that against this eagles defense like they're legit like studs against that you just can't run against it because there's just heavier bodies and they load the box so I think it's going to be a heavy light bodies game for the Rams in both the run and pass. I think that's how you get after them. I think you're going to spread it out. I think they're going to put Stafford in the gut or obviously in the gut, but in empty and just let him go after Zach Cunningham and go after the interior, the spine of this Eagles defense. That's what I think is the best way. Also, the Eagles have been blitzing a little bit more. Obviously, it was pretty easy to blitz more than Gannon. Ha ha ha. <laughs> but it's, it's, they've been blitzing a little bit more. And I think with Stafford, uh, you can't blitz them when they're spreading it out like this. You know, this offensive line is playing very well, playing very smart. And Stafford gets the ball rid of the ball in less than two and a half seconds. So you can't even get home when they do get leaky. So I think that's going to be, there could be a lot of yards piled up for Matthew Stafford against this defense right now. Not to say that the Eagles defense isn't bad at all. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't try to run the ball very much. I, I think we're going to see Matthew Stafford throw the ball a lot in this game because the Eagles right now are playing with the second lightest boxes in the league on early downs. It's like 66 or like 62 percent of their snaps. They have six or okay. fewer guys in the box. League average is yeah. 47, but yeah. they're actually defending the run. OK, they are out of those looks. So the Rams, are gonna, we know this, they're going to play with mostly 11. So they're going to get those light boxes. But I, I don't think I think the Eagles want you to run into those looks. It oh, with yeah. the, the personnel that they have up front. So trying to take advantage of a couple of those guys in coverage feels like the move. And yes. the number that jumped out to me. So the Rams lead the NFL, not surprisingly, and throws between the hashes. Okay. Yeah. They've, <laughs> one, they've, they've attempted 25 throws between the hashes. The league average is nine. Yeah. That, that's insane. nine. And they've attempted 25 over their first four games. Very, very small sample size but the Eagles are 30th at EPA per drop back on passes between the hashes. Just yep. think about where the Eagles are worse. Yep. And I'm just imagining all of the high lows we've seen from the Rams this year, That's all it. of them, where you're trying to pin down a linebacker, you're trying to bring something behind it. I think that their goal in this game is going to be it, to put Zach Cunningham in, in, in to, to use your parlance, the walls of Jericho. <laughs> yes that's exactly it it's it might be the walls of jericho with the mandible claw uh because that is cunningham you bring zach cunningham in to stop the run that is what he, he is has and he has that but he's playing all three downs for them and in the past he's been a sometimes two down player and then when it's passing situations zach thank you for your services get off the sideline and but now okay, we're going to be an 11 personnel. He's going to be on the field. If we spread this out, he's going to be on an island. And if, okay, okay, we're going to change the picture up. Let's blitz him. You don't blitz this offense because, again, everyone's spread out. They're on islands, and you got Stafford in this offensive line. So that's where <laughs> it's not really pick your poison. It's, yes, the Rams are really good at this, and the Eagles aren't that great at defending this, and I think they're going to really lean into it and just sprinkle in a couple spread runs, which they've been really good at too. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a very interesting matchup because the Eagles have been so good stopping the run. I finally found the stat. Okay. The, sorry. Eagles defense in their 3-4 base. 18 runs. Only one has been successful for the offense. Jesus. 
so yeah, you don't you don't you don't try to bully this this defense. You spread them out and try to out finesse them. That's that's how you have to go you know, do it. Matchup wise, looking at the interior of the offensive line, obviously Jalen Carter has been excellent. Yeah, I don't know what is going to happen positionally for the Rams because Joe Nopum and Alaric Jackson, who is playing left tackle for them, are not practicing. <laughs> so I don't know what that means for who's going to yeah. play left tackle. Kevin Dotson, who they traded for right before the season started again another i think shrewd decision to build some depth at an important spot he played right guard for them against the colts on sunday mm -hmm. but even if he was fine against the colts defensive line this is a different sort of beast and yeah. what he's potentially going to be playing against so that's something to watch and i don't know how the eagles secondary is going to shake out because now they sign bradley roby he's on the practice squad he's practicing with the nickel players this week Okay. Meaning they're going to bump James Bradbury back outside, most likely. So does that mean we're going to see Bradley Roby this week in the slot after signing? Because that's going to be a tall task communication-wise against a Rams offense that is using an obnoxious amount of motion, is, is how yeah. I would put it. And <laughs> obnoxious is right. Yeah. The stuff they're doing, like, they're having, like, Puka, you brought it up on Sunday. Puka Nakua, they had a motion twice once was play action once was a run from all the way from the outside on one way to run all the way to the opposite hash go in between the guard and the tackle and or tackle and tight end and then run all the way back on an over route to where he started so he ran like a hundred yards on the play before and he Stafford like, was joking this week I was reading Jordan Rodriguez piece about the way their offense was playing and he's like yeah we got guys running gassers on some of these plays I, I appreciate their sacrifice oh Tutu Atwell just every play just back and forth everything but th it's a great point and you might have Cooper cut back. Who knows? But uh, where does he play? The slot. So uh, that's kind of interesting as well. And again, this the Eagles team has done some do double mug stuff as far as blitz blitzes. And they got uh, Washington a couple times on it. That's something the Rams, again, take advantage of. So it's I'm very curious of what the Eagles lean into. I almost want to say that they try to make it as long as po these drives as long as possible and just keep a lid on it. I, I think that's the best way to go about it. Maybe have your front win against some backups or banged up offensive linemen. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. But again, if yep. you can tie down the linebackers and just try to play behind them a little bit, we've seen how yeah. successful they've been attacking that area of the field. So it's going to be a very cool matchup to watch yeah. and just how the yeah. how, how the Eagles staff try to solve, tries to solve some of those problems. Might, might be a 2-2 two -two at well, uh, deep ball. Be, be looking out for that too. I don't know. I, I, I need a, a Stafford Nakua blow up spot for my fantasy <laughs> life. So that, that that's what I'm betting on. I'm, I'm going to will that into existence. All right. <laughs> It's time to talk about a couple units that aren't necessarily playing so well. We're going to go under the hood. For people not familiar with this segment, we talk about a unit or two that is playing better or worse than mm -hmm. we might have expected. And I hate to do this to you, buddy, okay. but we're going to talk about the Falcons offense today and it's the Giants offense. So these two teams, both of which were, let's say they outperformed expectations last year. Like their ability to piece their offenses together with suboptimal personnel in some moments was very impressive. The Falcons finished ninth in weighted offensive DVOA last season. The Giants finished 11th. Quick rant. I don't want us to retcon the Brian Dable coach of the year thing now, <laughs> where it's like he never deserved it. This was a mirage. The Giants were a mirage. Do that. Just take it and away. I in a lot of ways. People are trying to do that. They're like, oh, it never should have happened. This was fraudulent. The you Giants look awful. And we're gonna and we're gonna get into why the Giants look awful. Yeah. This was a borderline top 10 offense made of mostly not NFL players. What they did with that group last year to string together right. efficient NFL offense was very, very impressive. There was always going to be a question with this quarterback and with this supporting cast about what the next stage of it would be. Could they take it beyond, oh, that's kind of interesting, to we are a full-fledged NFL offense? The answer to this point has been no, but that doesn't change what happened last year with the personnel that they had. I just want that on record because I've seen a lot of that over the last couple of weeks, and that's not how this works. It's not like we're doing 2022 all over again. And there I got, they're not hitting it this time. It's 2023. It's You, you can't, you can't. 
There's no agent that paid the Heisman Trophy winner. We're not taking you away. There, there's nothing of that. You can't do that. That's that Giants team punched way above their weight and were in a lot of games and like even games they lost, they were sticky with some good opponents. So no, you're not taking that away. That's funny. Thank That's you. I didn't know. I knew people were mad of mad at the Giants. Obviously, it's New York, but I didn't realize that people were doing that. <laughs> The reason that I bring up those numbers is to contrast them with this year's numbers. The Falcons and Giants through four games, respectively, are 31st and 32nd in passing DVOA. The Falcons are 25th overall because their running game is still very good. The Giants are dead last. So we're going to get to the Giants, but we're going to start with the Falcons because you predicted that they would be a top five offense coming into this year. We're not going to talk about what my prediction for them was because it's not important. Where do you want to start with the <sighs> issues that we have seen with Atlanta's offense to this point? I'll be okay. honest with you, buddy. I, at halftime on Sunday, when it was like 11, it was like 10 p.m., 10 a.m. here, I was ready to smash the panic button. So I, I think we need to kind of walk this back a little bit, potentially. Yeah. I, I think uh, halftime is a good cu- cutting off point because second half Falcons, okay, I'd be like, hell yeah, we're okay. We're okay. But first quarter, Desmond Ritter has me terrified. And I think first 15, 20 plays and first quarter and a half Falcons play calling, not play calling, but call sheet has been a little too expanded, a little too, uh, what's the play, uh, Cheesecake Factory uh, menu going on right now. But I think these things are fixable. And I'll talk. I'll first talk about kind of like just some kind of schematic and maybe play calling stuff that's been a little interesting or not, not interesting, I should say. And maybe some guys are maybe what the issues are. What I've noticed at first is maybe a little too expanded play calls, well, too much stuff. We're trying to figure out what we do. And I think they do a good job of honing it in as the game goes along. But it's like, let's just get, you can't. Why they've been better in the second half of games. They've been a top 10 offense in all the metrics, all the passing, rushing, everything in the second half. But in that first quarter, it just feels like sometimes we're trying to do too much. And I think there's just been bust by players that they think they, not only just players that they can rely on, but they're supposed to be their good players. Uh, uh, Chris Lindstrom, who I think is one of the best guards in the league, all pro pick last year has had moments of just like, not just like where he's making a mistake where, okay, I didn't win on that rep, but just like bad ones. Like once, and I'm not saying he's playing bad. I'm just saying when his bad plays have caused some real issues during the game. It's a weird mix where he'll make a weird. play where I'm like, that's one of the most athletic se- plays I've ever seen a guard make. He, he had one last week and threw where, a safety like seven yards. It was like, it was unbelievable. He had one last week where he way overcommitted to, I think it was a combo or something. His entire body was turned. And then he like turned himself back around and launched himself at Foya Luicon yeah. and allowed there to be like a seven yard gain on that play. I was like, oh my God, that was insane. But then he has <laughs> several plays a game where it's like, eh mental mistake on a blitz gets yep. tripped up just these little tiny blips that are out of character for him and for some of these other guys we'd kind of come to rely on within this yep. offense yep and that's the thing is like even like drew dalman who has like you know some limitations he's as far as size he's their center yes um they use him very intelligently they put him on the move a lot but he's just had moments where he's messing up i i've just seen times where he's tripping or he's just not you know filling out and and and, and coming down to double team on some things like they have a lot of times where a guy's hesitating for a split second and it, and that's what it's a game of inches and a defender splits the gap and boom it's a one yard gain instead of a freaking 20 yard game on the safety or it's a um, a guy dropping a ball or Ritter spraying the fourth down throw. It's like these one moments, these one plays are ruining everything. So I think also just this offense, because the run game is good, they just haven't gotten these explosives through the pass game. And we know with uh, with Arthur Smith from his Titans days and now with these last two years with the Falcons, that's how this offense has to live. They have to create big, juicy gains on play actions. This is how A.J. Brown became A.J. freaking Brown, was catching these catch and run play action balls and taking them to the house. They don't have AJ Brown, but they can still create big plays. And they just been have had not only just misses, but negative plays on these. Ritter's been knocked down seven times on play action. He's been sacked three times and knocked down another four times. He's been pressured the second most uh, on the, in the NFL among all quarterbacks on play action dropbacks. Over half of his dropbacks, he's been pressured. The, the league rate on those is 35%. So I think, and I think some of it is, it's not as much, I'm going to get on Ritter, don't you guys worry. I'm not just totally saying, absolving him of everything. I just think that, especially in the Lions game, one guy's a step slow. One guy makes a mistake. And instead of it just being a zero-yard gain, it's an eight-yard sack. So their yeah. negatives have been just real negative. And this offense cannot win that way. They're supposed to be just stay on schedule, hit some explosives in the run game. The run game's been great. It's been so much fun to watch. 
this passing game has just not created the juice that it needs. So that is just, they have too many third and longs, too many second and longs. They have the third highest share of third and longs right now. It's like that offense, this offense cannot live that way. The whole point of this passing game is to be reliable and efficient and not to have negative plays. They're 22nd in passing success rate. They're 29th in EPA per dropback. That gap is explained by splash plays in a negative way. He's yep. taken 16 sacks and thrown three interceptions that have been bad interceptions in bad moments. So those negative plays, that's just not what you expect from this passing game. Even if the ceiling was low, the floor was supposed to be higher than this. Exactly. A couple of plays that I think are worth mentioning. Then the second quarter of the, of the game they played against the Jags on Sunday. There's a second and nine the play action from a heavy pistol set. And they run a little kind of like to the pylon clear out for Drake London. And then there's a big crosser from Kyle Pitts behind it. Kyle Pitts is wide open and he just bypasses it and throws it to Drake London. So that was one. The pick six. Okay. Another in breaker off play action that they're trying to hit. And it's not there. It's, it's gloved up the entire time. And he throws it right to the corner for a pick six. That play just cannot happen. And then later, they run the same play with the clear out and the big over, and he throws the over this time, but this time the safety's driving on it, and he picks it. One play after the pick six. So there are some elements where the details need to be better from other players, but that stretch, tell me why I shouldn't be terrified about that stretch of like two drives in the second quarter when I go back and rewatch it. When we... When we were previewing it, I was getting real excited about this offense was that I thought Ritter could help out their straight drop back game and third down just to be efficient. And he has been on third down. So I'm saying why you shouldn't jump off a roof with our takes. But it's it's right now it's to me. And this is something which is this is why I'm a little hesitant is Ritter has had the same thing since college where early in games, he's all over the place. He galaxy brain stuff. He tries to do too much launching the, the that deep ball to London, which was like, I get thrown the alert, but it's early in the game. Take the over, you know, just take the big, the 20 yard gain, not the, not go for the big, you know, especially when you don't have punch. many 20 yard gains that you're finding in your pocket. Right. Just take it, take the double. Don't try and stretch for a triple. And I think a lot of times is there was a third down on, I think the first drive uh, against the Jags where they run a choice route to be John Robinson and Ritter double clutches it and doesn't throw it. And he's okay. staring right That's at it. Cassie walked Dalman right back into it, and it, it turned into a sack. But it that ball, positive play. ball should be out. First down, move the chains here. Let's get a run game going. And I just, and to me, it looked like he thought they were going to jump it. But it's like, that's like, I think it was first or second pass attempt of the game or drop back of the game. It's like, just rip it. I've seen you throw that. Just rip it. So again, and then also the pick six, uh, or I'll get to pick six and six, but six in a second. Um, against Quay Walker, he had an almost pick er, against the Packers where he almost threw one over the middle where I joked about it. I was like, again, I think he's galaxy brain this stuff. He gets to number three when it's like, number one is freaking open. Just throw it. Don't yeah. think that they're going to jump it. Just, they'll jump it as the game goes along. That first quarter, just, hey, take the gimmies. Just take it. They, they're giving you easy bunnies, buttons. Take it. But um, also, the so the pick six, it was, so it was a slant flat, and Drake London runs a terrible route. But this is a great example of why not only being a quarterback is hard, but also this is what quarterbacking is. You, if you see a guy running a bad route or not getting open or getting sticky or falling down, the quarterback has to make it right. You do not throw it. As soon as Drake London loops that route, that slant, because it just got coll collisioned, check it down. Tyler Algier was right in front of you. It's first and 10. They were driving on that, on that, uh, when he threw that pick six. They're at midfield. And so that is quarterbacking. It's, hey, okay, the play's not going to get us a huge play. Okay, just take the five yard gain. Now it's second and five. So that is where I, I hesitate because I see these third down things. I see him settle down, but then there's those moments where he's trying to do too much or he just has this blackout moments. And so that's, there are some encouraging signs and I'm not totally sold out on him yet, but it's like, that's the stuff he has to clean up because that's been the issue. The less than perfect route by Drake London on the pick six. That has shown up a lot over the last couple of games where this is a team that I think part of the reason we were so excited about them, it reminds us of the Cardinals conversation that we just had. The details are there. The details were there. They look so Bad crisp and well beater. coached. Yes. On yes. that on that side of the ball. They look so crisp and well coached. And that sort of sloppiness has actually been way more prevalent on their tape over the first month of the season than I absolutely could have expected. You got some rounded off routes. Guys just selling stuff in a way that doesn't make sense. Like 
there was a play in the first half where they've got like a slant flat with Kyle Pitts, but he like bends it outside for some reason and like allows the corner, like allows the linebacker to get back to it. And then that brings me to another thing. Pitts doesn't look right still. Yeah. So now you have a sloppiness. Mm-hmm. You have arguably your most explosive offensive player, not named Bijan Robinson, clearly not all the way back yet. Yep. And then that leads to, in my opinion, a lack of juice at the pass catching spots. Like you can feel their lack of explosiveness on the outside, outside of their running back. And that makes things feel compressed. So if you're not going to be super detailed in a compressed space, whether that's the route running details of your pass catchers or the decision-making details of your quarterback, you're going to run into a lot of issues and that's where they sit right now. And I think that's why it's looked so ugly at times. It's they, they can't live in third and longs and they're at the third highest rate of third and longs right now. That's it. Like right there. That's one stat you need to see of what's going wrong with this offense. This offense should be living in like middle of round third. They should have a ton of explosive plays in the passing game or a high rate of them, I should say. And then they should have a short third and long because their run game. So, so good. So having said all that, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not saying like I am re- recanting the take or anything like that. I am just saying that this offense has still shown in the second half that they can be good. They can be very good. Their ninth the run game is still awesome. 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 And the thing is, and this is why I think they have botches is because they're trying to do too much early in games. And that's, what's leading to big mistakes and big moments. They had Tyler Algier and I love the player. He went the wrong way on a play in the red zone last week because uh, Ritter checks to it. Remember long play calls. Okay. All right. All right. And he just spaces out. It happens. And it goes the wrong way. It would have been a walk-in touchdown. Instead, I think they end up going for a fourth down to Drake London. Don't get it. Game over, basically. So it's like those mistakes, but they're still they're figuring out their identity. They had so much stuff they wanted to do. And during games, they narrowed it down. And I think week by week, they're going to start narrowing it down. So they might not be a top five offense like I was hoping for, or I was really hoping to see. But I do have faith that they can be still that kind of top 10 unit that's so interesting to watch because i do think ritter's doing some nice things on third down and when he calms the fuck down when everything's spread out he just calms and chills down everything's moving at a, a nice pace so i'm not totally sold out on yet but it just was you know there are some some things they need to clean up all right let's have an honest conversation here okay this is a this is a trust tree safe space okay how much longer can this go with ritter playing at this level with the passing game playing at this level when you have a guy that you paid premium backup money sitting on the bench that we have seen be at least a reliable option at quarterback during his career in the NFL and Taylor Heineke. I was asked this week, somebody, somebody asked me this week and I, it was put places and I, I, you know, it's whatever, but like, would you consider benching him? And I said, yes, because I would consider it because I think you have to based on their expectations, the support system that you have, you have to at least have a conversation about it. And Arthur Smith's response when asked about it this week, I thought was very telling. He said, listen, if we didn't have any hope that this was going to get better, if there weren't signs that it could get better, then sure, we would think about making changes. But we're not at that place yet. So I think that to me is a fair representation of it, where you at least have to start having the conversation if it continues at this rate. But there's still enough glimpses now where you don't want to cut your development plan off he's a guy you drafted he's a third round pick even if he's worse in this exact moment than taylor heineke is we know what taylor heineke is so that trade-off for a little bit of certainty that caps your development that i don't know if it's worth making that compromise this early in the process yeah he's eight starts in so it's like i almost want to like get him to a full 16 that we can look at and before that's i want a to long you know, way to go my friend. i know and like that's that, that's tough but it's going like this and that's the thing is i'm just i'm i'm they just have to clean up those first 15 20 plays because the last 40 has been good and he does calm down he's been in eight starts so far but he hits some tight window throws he does some throw down stuff he does the nice things that i was hoping to see it's just that he can't have those laps in concentration that's what he has to do. This is true game manager shit. <laughs> like this is what it is. Like so, you can't have the negative plays. As can't part of have part. negative. You can't plays. have the negative plays. You have to get on base so everyone else can knock you home. That's what you have to do. A couple of bullshit things that I wanted to mention very quickly. The best runs that they had against the Jags were in twenty personnel with a fullback and three receivers on the field because it got the bags, the Jags in nickel defense. Yeah. The Jags run defense and base is just a non-starter. Because of the bodies that they have in the field, Fatu Kasi, what Trayvon Walker is. And I thought it took a little tiny bit too long 
for the Falcons to click into yep. when we have three receivers on the field, we can gash them on the ground. In yeah. those moments in that game, they had 17 carries for 154 yards with a 52% rushing success rate when they had three receivers on the field. And they just didn't get there quite fast enough. Exactly. It's like a perfect example of like they just, just too late. And it's like, no, okay, just do the drive earlier. Lat and talking about the run game. Cool run though. They, it was a, <laughs> yes. And they had a lot of cool run. <laughs> So I real quick, real quick, see. the run is they pull Mac Hollins like a tight end and run like counter yeah. with him. It's pretty freaking sweet. And so, because sorry. he is a tight end in that moment, but the defense yeah. doesn't treat him like that. So exactly. it allows you to dictate personnel. And I think they're going to have more of those realizations over the season because I they're agree. throwing so much shit against the wall. As they throw shit against the wall, I need more from the seventh overall pick in the passing game. Yeah, the, Using him as a check down, running him into the flat off motion, it's not going to cut it when you don't have explosiveness at your other pass catching spots yep and so just go look at the ways that the niners are using cmc and the matchups they're creating for him it's a one-for-one -one comparison because your personnel is the same you want to live in the same sort of personnel packages so the ideas that they have for this dynamic player that they have you can just wholesale take them there was a play they ran against the cardinals he goes to jet motion the same way we've seen Bijan do it a dozen times this year Instead of running out into the flat, he runs a whip to the two receiver side coming back into the middle of the field. They get him on the move and he's gone. It was like a 25 yard gain. So just little things like that. Absolutely. They, they right. real quick, real quick. They have one glimpse. They ran, they ran, tried Bijan on like a sail route in the red zone. So the, I think they're getting there again. I think they're getting there guys, but we'll move on to the next thing. Sorry. It's going to get some Falcons. Uh, <laughs> Falcons takes off the, off the chest. <laughs> Let's get to the Giants. What the hell is wrong with the New York Giants offense right now? Oh, they have a beat up offensive line. They have a quarterback that's not really that's feeling it, uh, not feeling it as a thrower and just feeling the pass rush. That's that's what it looks like to me. And it's a trickle down effect right now. They, this offense is trying to help out that O line. They're trying to give chip help. They're trying to give uh, six offensive linemen in, in, in pass protection. They're trying to do max protect. But what's that? What that is doing is it's limiting how many pass catchers can go out there, and I think that is not playing conducive to Daniel Jones's game. Not that like he he has a lot of limitations, but he does do some things well. And because that tightness, and because he is getting kind of some happy feet and bailing from pockets, it's having just a trickle down effect where this offense can't operate down to down. Having said that, I'll get to a positive in a sec. But I think that is exactly right now. Daniel Jones is hell or high water going through the first read. And if that, that's not there, he is bailing. Exactly. It doesn't matter how, how clean the pocket is. That's the problem is that you're playing whack-a-mole where, okay, <laughs> yeah. our problem is we can't protect. And if you look at some of the things that they're doing, it makes total sense, especially yeah. early on in the game against Seattle. All right, let's get 12 personnel out there. Let's keep the tight ends in protection. Let's give our guys a chance. Let's try to take some shots. Well, that's gloved up because you got two guys out in the route. And then as soon as he doesn't see it, he's out. So that's a problem. All right, let's run some RPOs. You know, like let's try to make sure we're getting the ball on the perimeter quickly so we don't have to hold up in protection. Ah, uh, we hit one, but we've got a legal man downfield. Now it's second and 12. Now we're in a defined passing situation. Well, we can't really use play action with heavy personnel here because they know we're not going to run. It's just this snowball effect. And the problem here, when you compare it to a situation like Seattle, for example, right? Seattle has two backup tackles. And I know they were hurt in the interior last week, but the tackles have been the main issue. You can kind of plan for that. And they've done a really good job planning for that. With the Giants right now, everyone's talking about, well, Andrew Thomas isn't playing. Andrew Thomas isn't playing. That's not the issue. Josh Azuda, who's a guard playing left tackle for them right now, it hasn't been great, but he is far from the only culprit. What is going on on the interior? Again, exacerbated even more. John Michael Schmitz gets hurt during the game. You got to bring in the center. You got to slide Shane Lemieux over. I mean, it's just all the things that are happening right now. You can't account for four of your five guys not being able to block guys one-on-one. -on -one. And right. that's what's happening right now. So there's just no good answer because every time you plug a hole, another one sprouts. And when you combine that with a quarterback who is pulling the ripcord immediately, every single time there's like a flash of pressure because of how uneasy he is in the pocket, you get the Giants offense right now, what it looks yep. like. I don't know what you do until it you get healthier on the offensive line and you can just have better bodies up there. I truly don't know what the answer is because they've been trying to throw answers at it. They have. I would throw at it and it still isn't working. 
it's not malpractice. They're trying. They're trying to do what they what you're supposed to do, the traditional ways. You. So I know, and I you we mentioned it on the pre-call, and then like when I went back and watched it, I was that's exactly what I saw. And that um on top of it, because so like this is a difference, like what the Seahawks did. Yes, they did, they've done a good job shoring up those tackles and everything. And with the Giants, is this is also a difference of having true dudes at pass catcher and a quarterback willing to rip it is Gino, even with the backups in there, he's going to stand there, plant that foot, and rip those deep throws to just give that offense space. With the Giants, you know, Saquon's out. So the run game's always going to just be not what it should be. Okay, we got to pass it, but if you have a quarterback that's just going one and done with his reads and taking the low option on every type of high-low or taking the number one option on every type of read, like so it doesn't matter what the concept is, outside, inside, quick game, Jones is going to go one and done. That's what he's at right now. Uh, but the thing was, I did notice in the Seahawks game, the other way that you can help your O line out, and this is a leaning into the punch kind of thing, kind of thinking, is to go five five man protection and get all five pass catchers out, and just saying, hey, we'll overwhelm them with pass catchers and help give us some breathing room, just win that way. Okay. They they were doing okay against the Seahawks until they had that pick six, but that's what that was one way that they helped. It's not to live in that way. But to just throw that in along with the play action stuff. But that's what you have to do. You have a, an offensive line that's beat up and you don't have that true ace. We all like Waller, but we don't they don't have that true ace as a pass catcher to kind of just go, we're going to design this one on one for him. You know, if you watch the Bengals, they max protect. They can just run 989 because they got two dudes that are going to win on the outside. So that's great. But the Giants don't have that right now. The personnel just can't win this way. Because we spent 20 minutes talking about the Cardinals and the Texans, we don't have time to do this, but we're going to have like an honest conversation about the Giants offseason decisions and where this franchise is very soon. Yeah. And some of the bets that they made, the mm -hmm. prudency of some of those bets and what this potentially means for them in the long term, because independent of the line being a disaster, you see kind of the suboptimal talent level across the entire roster. And when yeah. you've made some of the commitments that you've made, like they have to the quarterback and to yeah. this version of yourself, we're seeing where it's falling short right now. The, the, the it's kind of an eye on the misfit toys with the pass catchers. And that's and a quarterback and, who's making $47 million against the cap next year. That's supposed to help that out. And that's why you pay those guys. They're supposed to boost it. And that this discussion, these last two teams we're talking about, that's, this is what it is. The quarterback has to live up to the, whatever expectations that they do have. All right. We had to bring it back for this week specifically. Yeah. The Wick Meter is back. For those of you who don't know or are not familiar, we like to look at revenge games in the NFL as a measurement of one out of five John Wicks, the ultimate revenge character. People keep asking if I'm back. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. The reason we had to bring this back is it's Jets Broncos week. Think about training camp. Think about the moment that story came out. I'll never forget where I was. Oh, shit, I, I, shit, I, shit, I forgot where I was. I was in a hotel. I know. I was in a hotel. No, I was not you in August. I was reading a story on my phone, the USA Today story, and I was like, oh, my God, this is truly insane. And was... then you saw all of the backlash to it, the reaction that the Jets had. So just just a couple just a reminder about what Sean Payton said about Nathaniel Hacken about last year's Broncos in that story. On the coddling of Russ, allowing him to do whatever he wanted in the building. That wasn't his fault, Peyton said of Wilson. That was the parents who allowed it. That's not an incrimination on him, but an incrimination on the head coach, the GM, the president, and everybody else who watched it all happen. On Nathaniel Hackett and the coaching. But everyone's got a little stink on their hands. It's not just Russell. It was a poor offensive line. It might have been one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. That's how bad it was. <laughs> Oh, what a promo. What a heel promo right there. That's what uh, we get. That That's what we got. Are the, are the so, the GM very rarely, president still there? <laughs> GM and president are still there, which is come off with a lot of it are there too. That's uh, okay. The, some of the offensive linemen are there. So now we, I can't remember anything like this where no. you have a head coach of a team completely shit on his predecessor in public like this. And then now his predecessor will be on the opposite sideline. Granted, it's lost a little juice with it being Zach Wilson at quarterback and not right. Aaron Rodgers as part of this matchup. But the Broncos defense is so bad that there is a chance Nathaniel Hackett can exercise the correct amount of revenge on Sean Payton in this game. Could be some nice mouthwash for the Jets going against that Broncos defense. But the, the, the low key, 
one of the matchup of the weeks is Broncos offense, Jets defense. Broncos offense isn't bad. They're, they're, they are uh, fine. Shout out to Russ. Russ is playing pretty good ball right now, and they're playing a great offense for him. But that's that's a, that's like a cruiserweight match in old WCW. Did we say how many stars this game is? It's five. Oh, it's five. Right? It's five, easy, five out of five, five wins. This is five yeah. out of five. I mean, when, when you have this hesitate. level of enmity, it, this it's five out of five. Yeah. The next one we're gonna do. I haven't seen John Wick four, by the way. That's actually on my watch list. Oh my list god. I know. I know. I know. I just haven't didn't see it. It's just I missed it. So uh, yeah, oh, you're gonna watch go. that this month. You yeah, gotta yeah. go. There's some set pieces that are like truly the best ones I've. Oh, and it's wait. there's it's there's a set piece that's in Paris and it's set to a justice song and it's an incredible justice song. So you have like just great French EDM over like this beautiful like Parisian setting. I was really enjoying it. I can't wait. All right. Next one here, Devonte Adams. Playing against the Green Bay Packers. Obviously, his first career game against yes. Green Bay. What are we looking at here? How many wicks out of five? I think two. Really yeah, good. I think that's probably right. Yeah. Because he wanted to leave. Yeah. They they wanted to bring him back. So even if there was a little tension about what his contract would look like, it's not like they shipped him off. If it were up to them, he'd probably still be on the team. And we, I mean, look how much he's getting paid. <laughs> so I, I think he's yeah it's the uh woody harrelson gif where he's just crying with the the dollar bills yeah it's like i think he's okay but uh yes yeah, so i'm just going with two maybe there's some animosity that we don't know about but yeah I don't, I, it's not it's not as hot as it could be as a heavily and heavy, heavy investor in uh Devontae adams fantasy shares fantasy shares this year i hope this is one of those games where he just gets like 30 targets in, in order to justify the the revenge here i love that you got forced into it that's just so funny like Trying to outbid the other person. I can't. It, Devontae Adams can't go for this low. Just, it was. It was. It was between Devontae Adams and AJ Brown. I still wish I had AJ Brown, but I'm okay with how it all worked out. All right, Adams is pretty good. It, he's a pretty good player. That that was my mo- my rationalization in the moment during the draft. I was like, if the worst thing that happened to me today is that I have to have Devontae Adams on my team, who's maybe right. still a t- the second best receiver in the league, I'll probably be fine. I, I have him in a dynasty league, and it's always like that. It's like, oh, you know, he's thirty. He's still freaking good. So it had yeah, nothing to do good. with that. It was solely yeah. about having to watch Jimmy G every week. That was that was the only reason I was frustrated about it. It's the one you reason. A- you got AOC now. Yeah, it was it was great. It was it was it was a real wonderful viewing experience last week. <laughs> Cleo Mack with his six sacks, he had zero percent pass rush win rate for the first two weeks of the season. Yeah, he got six. I know there's I saw some Cleo Mack as wash takes. Yeah, the answer was six sacks. Now he has a five bagger and a six bagger. All right, it's time for win my fourth screen, where you guys get to pitch what belongs in the fourth screen of my early viewing slate. We're going to make some exceptions for this one because there were some good emails that don't necessarily fit in that box. But we are going to start. With Claudius Zenson, who says, let me take you on a journey through my football life. I saw my first game at 15 years old. Normally, there were no games on in TV in Germany, but they showed the Super Bowl in 2012. So my friends and I elected to watch it. Some of them are Patriots fans, but I didn't want to root for the favorite. And that Tom Brady guy just seemed weird to me. So I chose the New York Giants. They won. I thought, wow, this was great. New York is a cool city. Their team is good. I am a New York Giants fan. Nothing could have prepared me for the misery to come. I watched the games. I stayed up late. At some point, it became a bit, and I laughed about it. But last season, last season, something changed. Finally, a competent GM and head coach. We started to win games. So for the first time in 10 years, I had expectations coming into a season. This year, maybe we can finally do something and close the gap to the rest of the division. 40 to nothing Cowboys, 30 to 12 49ers, 24 to 3 Seahawks. I am at rock bottom. This team has taken my soul. I have watched every game, including primetime games, the last five seasons and all of the war crimes going on there. They start at 2.15 a.m. <laughs> I feel more sorry for the fans who go to the home games and are yet to see a touchdown this season. This week, we play the five-headed monster out of Mike McDaniel's dreams and everyone's nightmares, a creation of anger, fear, and speed. The Miami Dolphins, who are going to send us to the XFL, and we all know I'll be watching. So please, Robert, join me and countless Giants fans for the ride. We can't do it alone. Claudius, thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. You guys I just are, love it. I love it. That just having to watch games it. at 2 a.m. is just yeah. fantastic. There's something so sad about it. Oh, one more here. This one, oh, okay. Tony, this one is from Tony Dubber. Okay. okay. Who acknowledges Bengals Cardinals is an afternoon game, 
but I'm yeah. far too emotionally invested to not write one of these. I actually started working on it in the third quarter of Bengals Titans, <laughs> somewhere around the 19th, three and out. Tony says it's week five and the Cincinnati Bengals are dead. They're dead four weeks after many of the most respected sports writers in the country picked them to win the Super Bowl. Eight hey, weeks respected. and one day after Joe Burrow strained his calf in practice. Eight weeks and 23 hours after the entire tri-state area was holding its breath, waiting for word from the doctors. Eight weeks after it looked like Joe would be totally fine. As it turned out, Joe wasn't totally fine. He'll limp into Arizona as the second best quarterback in the game, also <laughs> featuring Josh Dobbs. Zach Taylor, who let Burrow play through the injury, will be facing more scrutiny than Jonathan Gannon, who doesn't know how buses work. <laughs> Bengals fans have, haven't quite lost hope, a testament to the incredible amount of trust Taylor's coaching staff has earned in just four years. But if the team keeps playing this poorly, that optimism won't last. Bengals Cardinals is shaping up to be a surprisingly monumental game. It is perhaps the Bengals' last chance to save their Super Bowl aspirations. If Burrow looks like himself again, the hopes and dreams of a thousand traumatized Cincinnatians will survive in advance. If not, the city will start to wonder if the last two years were just a dream. Bengals Cardinals, 4 p.m. Eastern. Join us. You'll wish you hadn't. Wow. Bravo. Great stuff. Great stuff Great from Tony. Stuff. Beller pointed this out. That's one listener from Germany and one who has an umlaut in his last name. Oktoberfest just ended. So this is our tribute to that. And also to Oktoberfest 2010, which remains <laughs> still the most ridiculous 72 hour stretch of my entire life. So we can tell that story maybe another time, but I owe the German people a lot. Yeah. So I wanted to acknowledge them in this moment. A better way to spend, give them another visit during Oktoberfest. You know, return a 14 year anniversary of the best 72 hours of your life or wild. I didn't say bad. I should say best. Why most wild 72 hours of your no, life? No, it's a good, it's a good story. I'll, I'll, I'll talk good. to you sometime. Can't wait. I also want to acknowledge my brother who sent one in today. This is just a product of him being on paternity leave. He sent me a photo yesterday of his daughter on his chest while he was playing NBA Live. So he's got a lot of time on his hands. So I appreciate him sending in a message. I, I tried to do that. I just couldn't when, when my son was a newborn. It was just like he he's too fussy. He he would not he would not tolerate me me playing video games. That girl was out. So he he again, he's got a lot of time Challenge. on his hands right now. All right, buddy. It's time for Tyson's touts. Your three favorite bets of the week. <laughs> Lay it on me. There's actually a couple games I avoided because I just wanted to watch and enjoy. And Bengals Cardinals was one of them because I was just was so curious. So I didn't want to wager on it and get frustrated at either team. Uh, so I stayed away from it. Uh, there's a couple like that, though. But one game that, you know, just want to just want to check this out. I like this. I'm going Patriots plus one hosting the Saints. Uh, even with Christian Gonzalez out, those Saints weapons, Derek Carr has never had a positive EPA game against Bill Belichick. Uh, and three starts, it, all of them been negative. Uh, the Patriots defensive line has a matchup advantage against the Saints offensive line. It's pocket pushers. And I don't think that Saints run game is overwhelming. I'm going to take the Patriots at home. Um, uh, next one, I'm going another home dog. I'm going the Rams plus four and a half. Kind of kicking myself here because I just wanted to enjoy this game. But Rams hosting the Eagles. I'm just taking the points. I think this game's going to be really cool. I, th I think there's going to be a lot of points. Uh, so... I'm just taking the points. I'm going. I, I this is bad because it's going to be like Eagles. Oh, four, four and, and a half. Rams four and a half ho, at home. That's not that many, man. I know. I know. I was hoping to be like six and a half, and no one be on the Rams or something like that. But here we are, four and a half. Let's do. Let's do it. Why not? Why not? Okay, and then we're going the Hackett Bowl. Broncos minus two and a half hosting the Jets. I can't stop betting these Broncos. Why not? They give up <laughs> seventy points to everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess this is the good feelings bowl. I guess bad feelings bowl. It's the feelings bowl, but I I'm going Broncos minus two and a half at home. I, I just, I like what their offense is. I think they can slog it up. Maybe not get embarrassed on defense against this jets offense. So we'll see. It's funny that those two teams have good feelings right now because yeah. the jets lost a close game and Zach Wilson looked competent. So things are pointed up and yeah. the Broncos thankfully had a horrific last few minute collapse from a team that's in worse shape than them. So that, that is the state of those two franchises. That's right. That's what I meant. Right Silver linings. Silver linings bowl. That, that's exactly it. They, they both needed a win. Like literally, like, you know, like in a game wise and also in life wise, it seems like. <laughs> Speaking of it's a, win it's, life wise. Well, it's, a, it's a loser leaves town match between the Jets offense and the Broncos defense. That's where I'm putting <laughs> it at. <laughs> the stoppable force means the movable object. Tune in. Speaking well, of people who need a win in life. <laughs> I'm a little scared about tonight. As you guys listen to this, the game will have already probably God. happened, but you can come watch the recap on YouTube. Uh, 
tonight is bears washington on thursday night football we will be doing a live recap after the game yes we will it almost broke me last year this this exact game in this exact situation so if you want to watch an empty husk of a man on video come watch our thursday night football recap on our youtube channel where there's also a lot of great worthwhile content being put out i thought you were gonna do a bit there if you want to watch an empty husk of a man and robert mays (laughs) i thought you were setting up a bit i actually was like oh here it comes (laughs) anyway that's all we got for this week please come back and check us out on sunday night uh we as always we do our Sunday Night Recaps live on YouTube, so you can come back and watch those. They're available on the YouTube channel. Very excited. A lot of great stuff to dig into this week. For now, that is all we have.